Handling a quilt sandwich takes a lot of space, muscle, and effort. So you know that quilters out there will find an easier way. The quilt as you go method was devised so that you make the quilt sandwich at the block level and then sew them together one at a time. Today's guest, Pamela Weeks, is the Binney family curator of the New England Quilt Museum. She is also the author of Portable Quilting. And in her research, she has found that quilters have used this method since the early 1800s. And she's gonna tell us all about it. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Pamela Weeks. Welcome to the show, Pamela. Where about in the world are you coming to us from? I live in Auburn, New Hampshire, which is near Manchester. It's a big city in New Hampshire, which is about 150,000. Are you originally from that area? I am the 13th generation in my family to live in New Hampshire, but I was raised um, in the central part of New Hampshire, and I've lived in different places around the state. I went back in my ancestry, and I've got people from New Hampshire, too. We might be related. <laughs> it's very likely, um, because I'm a genealogist. That's it. I turned into a serious genealogist when I started researching signature quilts, which has led me to enter most of my family trees into Ancestry.com or Family Search. The big question always is, how did you get into quilting? <laughs> I am a child of the 60s, um, the back to earth movement. I was never truly a hippie, but I blame it on the bicentennial and the uh, huge increase in interest in the old ways, you know, cooking, gardening, and craft. And took my first quilting class. Well, I got the started taking the magazines in the mid 70s, but I took my first formal class in 1978 at the beginning of the, the major quilt revival that happened then. And I've quilted on and off. Currently, I'm doing more knitting than quilting, but it, I'm always researching something having to do with a quilt. What came first, the discovery of a quilt-as-you-go quilt or your quilting? My quilting came first, but I was very familiar in the 1980s with Georgia Bone Steel's work, uh, lap quilting. And she um, did not invent quilt-as-you-go. It's a, a lot older way to finish a quilt than a lot of people understand but she made it very popular with a series of really good books and television shows at the time i've just got into quilt as you go as well mainly because i had a pile of scraps that i wanted to clean mm -hmm. up and it's very interesting how many people just absolutely love that technique or get excited by that technique as opposed to quilting a huge quilt sandwich Therein lies the beauty of it. If you choose to make a quilt in sections, let's say you're making a big piece and applique quilt in blocks or sections, because quilt as you go can be done in thirds or in quarters of a quilt. You just have to figure out how to put those pieces together. But let's say you get sick of the piecing and you can layer and quilt what you've already pieced or applique and then go back to more piecing when you need to finish another section of the quilt. Um, some of the earliest references to it uh, relate to having um, a group project, uh, collaborative quilting spurs quilt as you go. When I got deep into my research on potholder quilts, those that are made of individually bound sections, that's when I got serious because I put all my data in chronological order and at that time had six quilts made specifically for Civil War soldiers that were made potholder style. And I began to think about it and I went, okay, oh, fine. If I was the boss of the Auburn Ladies Soldiers Aid Society and we wanted to make some quilts for the boys, I would tell all the women who turned up at the meeting to go home this week and make as many blocks as you can, one foot square, quilted and bound. If you have blue fabric, then bind them in blue and we'll have a little bit of consistency in our figure. And when we come back next week, all we have to do is sew together the stacks of blocks and we've made some quilts. Fun part for me is people have become familiar enough with the work now that quilt guilds are beginning to make some raffle quilts, potholder style. And all they have to do is make sure all the members, if they're required to make a nine inch block, have their rulers out when they finish because there can be some inconsistency in the finish. Actually, my modern guild did a quilt as you go entry into QuiltCon, not the juried show, just the exhibit. 
I think about four years ago, and they were all different sizes. It was a feat of the person who finally combined them all together Mm -hmm. because she used the method where you whip stitch on the back. We had to leave them a little bit bigger, and then she whip stitched everything together. But you would never know from the front that Mm -hmm. was the the method that was used. Mm -hmm. So the the tops of the blocks or sections must have been sewn together and then turned, and the edge turned under and that bit whip, whip stitched. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I call the Georgia Bone Steel style. So the thing that I'm always curious about and people are anxious about is how well do these quilts hold up over time? Beautifully. And the secret is in the whip stitching and doing it tight enough so that it holds. I'm trying to answer your question. Have I ever found blocks at an antique shop that were liberated from a potholder quilt? I have, but it was very obvious that it was very worn and that they were cut. When you're doing research on a project, and I started this research in in, uh, the year 2000, I wasn't shy. I knew these quilts were rare, and I couldn't be shy about keeping my research secret. So I let a whole lot of people know um, in the American Quilt Study Group, which is a group of quilt historians, and gave myself the nickname of Potholder Pam. And immediately, they became the Potholder Posse. And I asked, please let me know if you ever see one of these animals because they're rare, but you can easily tell you're looking at a potholder quilt because when the blocks are sewn together, the bottom will ripple if it's hanging because of this, the seamed, um, the seamed blocks. And one night, a Monday night at uh, eight o'clock when Antiques Roadshow lit up, my phone lit up because there was a potholder quilt. Presented at Antiques Roadshow, but the bottom three blocks had come unsewn and they were sort of flopping on the floor. So that's the only example that I can think of of when the stitching did come undone, but very easily repaired. All you have to do is replace the whip stitching. Is that potholder method the the most common one that you found in your your research? Um, I don't know because... Um, A few quilts have come across my radar screen that are made quilt as you go in the the Georgia Bone Steel style where you sew the tops together, turn it over, butt the batting, and then whip stitch the backing over the backing beside it. Earliest one being 1837. I've only done statistical analysis on the potholder quilts that I found. I'm up to 167 in my database. What I do know is they're mostly a New England thing. For instance, Ruby McKim in 1930 writes about finding a way to sew sections together. I have seen some evidence in maybe just three or four 19th century quilts when collectors bring me what they think is a potholder quilt, but it's a different method for for joining the sections. So I really can't properly answer that question for you. How many different methods have you found of quilt as you go? You have my book and you've leafed through it. And you saw that I put a little field guide to quilt as you go in there. And I think I, I think I did five or six methods there. But there are artists today who are inserting strips when they sew rows of blocks together and the strips flip over and cover the seams. I've seen a potholder quilt. The edges were bound, but they were 1870 blocks. But in about 1920, someone took a zigzag machine and and sewed them together that way basically you have to answer it by saying any way you can figure out a way to to join sections is quilt as you go well the newest way that i know of it's a modern book and it's quilt as you go hexes or modern hexes and you actually take a hexagon pattern and you fold all the edges in and you end up with finished edges a finished section because you sew another bit on top of it and then you whip stitch the hexes together the new ways are coming up, not all the time, but but frequently. Yes, it's interesting how new people are putting spins on old things. And then you you find something where that, that what you thought was brand new has been done forever and ever. I got in trouble with some of the leaders of the Modern Quilt Guild about 11 years ago at the New England Quilt Museum. I had an exhibit called The Roots of Modern Quilting. And I took the five different categories at the time, you know, negative space, historic pattern, reproduction, or whatever the different things were called. And I invited Jackie Gehring and Victoria Findlay Wolf and a few other people to send me quilts. And then I went through our collection and the collection of some of our um, known personal collections in the area. And I pulled a quilt at least from 1930, if not before, using the same technique. 
For instance, pixelation is very popular with modern quilters. And I found a 19... 30s pixelated quilt from a, a, a designer named Annie Orr. And Jackie Gearing came up to me and said, are you making fun of us? And I said, no, you guys are a real thing. And we're all excited about this true renaissance in quilting called the Modern Quilt Guild. But you didn't invent it. It was there. And yours is just a wonderful riff on it. And the excitement is around the novelty of the way that you're interpreting the craft it's no longer our craft it's your craft as well nothing new is really new when did you start collecting quilts late 1990s and how big is your collection now is scott out of earshot <laughs> <laughs> um i think i have around 110 quilts wow 40 of them are potholder quilts and some of them are pretty darn ugly, but they're interesting examples of what the craft does. I primarily collect quilts now to illustrate the talks that I give. I speak to a lot of historical associations and quilt guilds, and I have a lecture called New England Quilts and the Stories They Tell. And I have an early whole cloth wool quilt and an early patchwork wool quilt. And I introduced the Industrial Revolution and how it changed the history of quilting, because if you wanted to make a nice quilt, before the 1820s, you had to import the fabric from Europe, and it was dollars per yard. And you were more likely to use leftovers from other purposes, like bed hangings, generally less clothing. By 1836, the New England mills were printing 65 million yards of fabric per month. And fabric went to pennies per yard. And that's when we see the huge expansion of, of quilt making by everybody who was interested in quilt making, could afford to make one. Um, oh, I started to talk about my personal collection in, uh, in more detail. I give a lot of talks and quilt guilds like trunk shows. So depending on what my talk is, I will have a tub full of quilts for that talk. So I, I give a talk called Quilted Gardens. And it's basically floral design 101. And I start with a slide from an Egyptian tomb that has water lotuses in it or whatever they're called, just lotus. And I come all the way up to what the modern quilt world is doing with stylized flowers and everything in between. So I have a tub of quilts for that and a tub of quilts for just about everything I do. You are the curator of the New England Quilt Museum. No. You've got a special title. My special title is related to the Binney family. I'm the Binney family curator of the New England Quilt Museum. Gail and Edwin Binney, daughter and father, were uh, antique quilt collectors. They had a marvelous collection. Being from Massachusetts, and when the museum was founded, they became interested right away. And the core of our early collection of 60 or 70 quilts came from the Binney family. So when my position was created uh, 11 or 12 years ago now, we decided to honor the Binnies, and I'm some of the Binney family curator. How many exhibits are going on at the Quilt Museum at one time? Between three and four. We have three easily geographically separated exhibit spaces. Because we were a bank building, it's very interesting to have four little, what used to be offices now called the pocket galleries. <laughs> and so I sometimes segregate the pocket galleries. Well, coming up in September, we will have four exhibits up. The Donahue Gallery is dedicated to um, exhibiting quilts from our collection. The, uh, what I call the main or the gray galleries would be the open area and the offices when you had to head it up the stairs from the tellers in the bank. Um, and I can put about 35 quilts, 35 full-size quilts in that area. The pocket galleries hold four apiece. And the genre gallery used to be probably the data bank for the bank. Then it was our classroom, and now it's a, a dedicated gallery space. And I currently have um, 20 art quilts hanging in that space. And what the, the separate exhibit spaces give me is the flexibility to have the goal of having something for everyone, which is one of our bylines. I try to have an excellent art exhibit, an excellent historic exhibit, and an excellent different exhibit. Um, right now, we have quilts in the Donahue Gallery from our collection from the 1930s and 40s and one probably 50s that have recognizable designers from the newspapers or from Mountain Mist or from a Boston-based designer who made storybook quilt patterns. 
And most of these women had successful careers as entrepreneurs, uh, marketing and selling patterns for quilting. The main galleries hold an exhibit of the prize winners from the 16th Quilt Nihon or Quilt Japan International Competition. And um, there are 36 quilts in three categories from miniature to contemporary to traditional quilts. They're all amazing. And the genre gallery has the work of a wonderful Massachusetts quilter named Tim Natar, whose work know has, Tim Natar. Been, you know, Tim Natar, she's wonderful, great sense of humor, modern quilts, um, truly not pixelated quilts because she takes two inch squares and does portraits of people or animals, but she does it through the division of the image into two inch squares and then further divides them based on color and value. And My favorite of hers is the meandering river. Uh, that's where I first saw her work. And I haven't looked it up. I've been a bit lazy with that quilt. I think I saw that at QuiltCon five or five or six years ago. Um, and we have it on exhibit. But her new work is just as much fun, the, the animal portraits in particular. And then we have as an introductory quilt, when you walk into that gallery, there's a picture of her shown from her glasses up. Her hair is standing up straight and her glasses are there. And the title is, I woke up this way. And her hair is just this like pile on top of her head. It's a wonderful little quilt. I think the first one she did in that, that technique was the one where I'm not sure if it's her her daughter or her son with a stinky fish. Yes. I was just so surprised <laughs> that she could get all that emotion into the, the face. Into two inch people. squares. I know. Yeah. It's amazing. So how many quilts are in the New England collection? Close to 500. With is um, probably another 200 pieces of ephemera from, well, the exhibit about the uh, the female entrepreneurs from the night from the first quarter of the 20th century, we have a lot of ephemera related to um, how they promoted their work. One of the women who donated a crib quilt made with Ruby McKim embroidery patterns also donated the patterns that she clipped from the newspaper when she was making it so we can put the quilt on exhibit and then we can also have a notebook that you can flip through to see the different embroidery patterns which is a pretty cool thing that two or three hundred pieces includes um, a wonderful collection of doll beds and thimble, right down to thimbles we probably have 50 or 60 thimbles so how did you get to become the curator of the new england quilt museum what's your background uh <laughs> That's the interesting part. I asked if I could have the job, basically. I was in the middle of writing my first book, the Portable Patchwork book, and um, I knew the director pretty well through a group of um, antique quilt historians that got together once a month. My degree is in recreation resource management, and I was the first Nordic director at one of New Hampshire's small ski areas in the 1970s. And I've been a nonprofit administrator and I've run restaurants as far as part of my father's restaurant business. And I've been an executive assistant and I worked for the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, which is where I got my exhibit experience. Um, and truthfully, my experience is with exhibits. It's, it's knowing the quilt world well enough to know what exhibits would attract visitors to our museum. Um, and I'm trying still, it'll be always catch up with the collection care. We have a wonderful collections manager, Laura Lane, who fills in all the gaps of my um, knowledge when it comes to collection care. I'm catching up with that. But we're getting the exhibits right. Our, our visitorship is up 30% since COVID. We're really happy about it. I know my, my group of Sew Sisters are thinking about getting down there to see an exhibit. So tell me about the quilt that's behind you. The quilt that's behind me is made by an artist named Michael James, who was one of the preeminent quilt pioneers, I'll call him that. He was trained in art and was an art professor, oh, at Fall River State, one of the Massachusetts colleges, and started early on. I think his first book came out in 81 or 84 on um, how to make art quilts. Uh, Michael James is someone worth looking into. Um, I'm lucky enough to own two of them now. I just keep my eye open for auctions because so much is landing on the market right now. 
that I just missed an incredible quilt that years ago would have cost three or four thousand dollars and it went to auction at 600. Is there research actively going on all the time at the New England Museum? Well I have a wonderful intern for the summer who's helping us transcribe a, a signature quilt. I think she's up to 1100 names. I don't have time to do much more than cursory research for whatever exhibit is going up next. Laura, the collections manager, pretty much handles the exhibits for the Donahue Gallery. But for instance, um, the last exhibit <clears throat> was on red and white quilts. And we have had a quilt in our collection for 30 years that no one has ever had the time to look up and see who the maker really was. And I dove into her genealogy and found out what part of Long Island she was, she was raised in. And just a quirky little thing, I couldn't find Tuthill on any of the family search or the ancestry files for where I knew she lived because the name was changed from Tuttle along the line somewhere. And her great-great-granddaughter who donated the quilt donated it as Tuthill, but in the census, she has a completely different name. So I'm answering your question too specifically. I do a lot of research at the museum on the collection quilts and a lot more research on my, on my own at home. I research much more than I make quilts. You also say that you're a genealogist. Where's the overlap between genealogy and quilting? Signature quilts. I fell in love with inscribed quilts in the early 1990s. I told you earlier on that I'm the, the 13th generation in my father's family to live in New Hampshire with only one known quilter in all those, in all those lines. So I figured that if I went to enough antique shops or online auctions or whatever, I could find a signature quilt in New Hampshire that had some of my family names. My first research paper for the American Quilt Study Group was written in 2004 with Lori Chase as my mentor. And we researched a Northwood, New Hampshire quilt that had um, signatures on it. We found out that she was from the poorest farm in one of the poorest towns, the top end of her county. And yet she had enough money to go out and buy the three fabrics that she needed to make a red and yellow and white signature quilt. We found the census map of her neighborhood and we were able to see, she just walked up the road, stopped at everybody's house and asked them to sign a block on her quilt. And then a couple of the other blocks were signed by people who lived in the next town, probably because both of those young women went off to the mills in Manchester, New Hampshire, and that's where she earned the money. But, but in the meantime, I had to do the, gener the, the genealogy backwards and forwards because I always like to see if cousins or aunts or uncles have signed the quilts. Um, we finally found her grave and she uh, had one daughter who died unmarried. So all her stuff is gone. There's no chance. I always hope that I'll find a great grandson or something who will have all the, the family the family photos. But that's where it intersects is, is with signature quilts. And with when you do find a maker, it really fills out the story to be able to say she lived in this town in Long Island and it was a farming town. And in the, in the 1880 census, her father was the richest farmer and, and had the most land sort of thing. It's, it's a way to fill in the blanks of someone's life when all she left behind was a quilt. Mm -hmm. Now you have a really gorgeous one in your collection. It's hexagonals and it looks like it's embroidered. That is not in my collection. That was made by Rhonda Dort. Oh, collection of the artist. I apologize. That's Rhonda, cool. I saw that. I hate going to Houston for um, for market. I don't I don't do well in crowds. But every time I go to Houston, I discover something spectacular. And her quilt was hanging in festival one year, and she very generously loaned it. But what she does is she takes vintage hankies and laces and things that have major damaged areas, and she cuts out the good bits. And as you saw from the hexagonal pattern, she tacks them down and adds embroidery and beads and all kinds of frou-frous and frills. And that quilt is just gorgeous. It's one of the most beautiful hand-done things I've seen with vintage textiles. How big is it? I don't think it's more than three feet square. I don't think I have the dimensions in there. Not on that one. Oh, you actually do have a full-size picture beside it. It's 36 by 36. So you're bang That's on. A good guess. <laughs> wow, you know your stuff. When you go to Houston and you're looking at the quilts hanging, 
Can you identify just by your your eye and your experience which ones are cult as you go and which ones aren't? Yes and no. The biggest hint with quilt as you go identification is an interruption of the quilting pattern at the join. If it's a potholder quilt, it's pretty easy because you can see the, the way each block is individually bound. And then if the person is joining Georgia Bones, we need a name for that. You, the way you sew the blocks together at the top and you flip it and you whip stitch the, clo the closing in the back. If she's really good at what she's done, she's able to quilt over the joins. So you really can't tell. You really have to have access to the back of every other kind of quilt as you go. Although there are some of the, um, I referenced briefly a, a technique earlier where strips are inserted into the but into the seam. And those you can pretty much tell because they really affect the design on the top. There are a couple of art quilters who build, they, they usually work in, in very easy to see strips and uh, vertical or horizontal or whatever fashion. And they'll plan the join of two larger machine quilted sections along a, a long strip. So the answer is yes and no. I came across a really fiddly technique when I was a, a beginner quilter. And they were having us make squares. We sewed the right sides together and around, and then we stuffed a piece of batting in the inside. And <laughs> a I thought, biscuit quilt. Mm -hmm. Why would anybody do it this way? Because it was a, an interesting technique to teach beginners and fill up a class session. I've done it. <laughs> They're called biscuit quilts. And the earliest one I've ever documented was about 1880. So they've been out there for a long time. Um, when you're flipping through the section in the last quarter of the 19th century, there's a silk quilt that's actually made of eight inch pillows. And she did crazy quilting patchwork for the top. And then she must have put them together face to face, sewn around the outside and left a place to turn it and to stuff it. And then sewn thing closed. But you can tell from a distance that it's a very puffy thing. So as a curator and a quilter, do you put a label on your quilts? Of course. And how do you, what do you advise people to put on the label? Personally, I plan my backing to sew a label into the backing fabric, even if I have to interrupt it. The second best, and I use archival ink on muslin, so it's very prominent. I'm one of these weird people who really, I really don't care what's on the back of your quilt as long as there's a label on it. And I just don't put a lot of bother into it as long as I can sign the thing. So, so I will piece, I'm probably a, a six inch square into the backing, or I will apply it by machine before I quilt it or before I send it off to be quilted so that it's quilted into the back of the quilt name, date, place where I was, and title of the quilt. And when I use wool batting, I put care instructions on it. Have you passed your love of quilting on to any other members of your family? My quilting buddy in my family was my aunt, my father's sister. We started quilting at the same time. She used to say that she liked to hang on to the tail of my star. And I would say, no, auntie, you're my guiding star. The potholder quilt that started the whole thing that we bought at auction, I was in Europe when the auction came up and I told her to go to this auction and buy the quilt, no matter how much it was. And that was the Sarah A. Levitt potholder quilt. She helped me with the research on that quilt that I told you about the poor farm girl. She was always part of it. So she was more my quilting sister than my auntie. What I'm trying to do is get my granddaughter interested in something in textiles, but she's a, a wonderful, wonderful tomboy and her older brother only likes Legos. But um, I only have the one son. There's a little girl in our neighborhood who I might be able to get into my sewing room, but we'll see. So what is your favorite quilt? Boy, that's a hard question to answer. Well, it, it changes week to week. My favorite quilt right now is the one I keep near my bed. My aunt made it. She died a year ago. And um, one of the joys of, of my world is that I've um, had the privilege of designing four different fabric lines. And auntie would always without even asking, receive a, a yard of everything when I did a fabric line. And she loved using my fabric and she made an alphabet quilt. And there are 20, actually 20, whatever, however the math works, there are 28 blocks, I think. So she's got a couple of blanks and the fabrics that she used for my lines are, are all in that quilt. It just makes me think of her 
My favorite antique quilt would have to be the Sarah A. Levitt quilt that I bought by accident that started the portable patchwork journey. The prettiest quilt I own is another potholder quilt made in Falmouth, Maine, probably in the 1850s. It's all made of the same very fine cotton fabric that looks like silk, and the hand quilting is exquisite. It's not in the book because it doesn't photograph well. What's funny about quilts, though, that they're absolutely gorgeous in person, but they mm-hmm. lose so much in the photograph. Unless you have a magician for a photographer who understands how to light so that it washes across the surface of the quilt and picks up the quilting. Because we all know that what we miss when we see the photograph is what the quilting looks like. Now, you've written a number of other books, too. Civil War quilts and... 100 years of women's suffrage. Now, is there a crossover in quilts with the suffrage movement? None at all. Not to at all. our knowledge, if you, if you had that book in your hand, you'd open it, you'd see the introduction by my co-curator, Sandra Sider, and then you'd see my 1,000 word introductory passage about what women's suffrage was in the United States. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Sandra limited me to, to 1,000 words. I read nine books and learned everything I should have known about suffrage in school, but it was never taught properly. The other thing you'd see in the beginning of that book are the two textiles having to do with quilts that we know are related to suffrage. Only one quilt exists, and it's hilarious because it's in the uh, collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. It has cartouches that have scenes of a woman participating in the suffrage movement. She's in one in her carriage with a votes for women sign over her shoulder with a pony drawing her carriage. In the next one, she's lecturing to a group in a hall. And in other cartouches, her husband is left at home to care for the children. And the baby is under the table. There's a big spill of something. The dog is lapping it up. And the other baby is sitting on her bottom on another part of the room. And then of all places in the Durham, New Hampshire historical society collection i was helping a friend go through some of the textiles and we found an embroidered block probably circa 1910 of a little dutch girl i say that colloquially the, with the little wooden shoes and the little lace cap with a sign over her shoulder votes for women but they weren't home sewing if they were sewing anything it was sashes or it was banners about their cause Um, They were out fighting in the streets for the vote. You mentioned you have a lecture. Um, Are you still giving lectures? I am. I try to keep it to one a week. New Hampshire has a humanities council, and they have a program called Humanities to Go. And there is everything from how to build a stone wall to um, what's happening today with women's liberation movement. And I have two talks that are vetted by them. One is about Civil War quilts. And what I um, need to do is relate something to New Hampshire. So I talk about one quilt of the 20 or so quilts that survive as documented to be made for Civil War soldiers. One of them was originated um, in New Hampshire. And then my other talk, as I said, is um, New England quilts and the stories they tell. And I start with Textiles 101 and go through the Industrial Revolution and through the social changes for women's lives that the, the Industrial Revolution created. And then I get more quilt related and talk about the different fads through the 19th and the 20th century. And I have a a hold up a quilt for each of those fads. And then I end it with something that people don't like to hear very much, especially um, your typical quilter who's just learning what quilts are now and loving them as comfort objects. But quilts have been used for almost 200 years in the United States to talk about difficult subjects. Um, The earliest documented is an 1836 quilt in the collection of historic New England that has an anti-slavery sentiment in the middle of it. And it was made for an anti-slavery fundraising fair and it was auctioned off. And it's well documented because it's mentioned in a newspaper report from the period. And then we had anti-alcohol temperance quilts in the 19th century. And then we skip to the 1960s and 70s. The Hudson River quilt was made in 74, 75 to highlight the environmental degradation of the Hudson River. And then keep on jumping forward. We have the Names Project, the AIDS quilt. And we have any topic of social injustice. 
uh, gun violence. One of the most moving one to me is a as an art quilter made an art quilt documenting the death of Trayvon Martin, mm. and uh, and if, if so many cents. Um, but quilts have been used that way for a very long time. So if people want to get a hold of you, how do they reach you? You can reach me at Pamela.weeks at gmail.com. That's my personal email through the museum. It's curator at nequiltmuseum.org. I have a website called Portable Patchwork, but it's mostly a brochure. You can see my list a little bit about me, some of the early quilts that I've made, and then my list of lectures is on that. And I guess this book is also available through Amazon. It is. If you want one signed by me, do email me and we'll figure out a way to get it paid and I'll get it shipped to you. I still have a whole lot left. So, <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and for discussing everything with me. I really have enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for, for your interest and thanks for reaching out. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Pamela Weeks. I am definitely putting the New England Quilt Museum on my list of places to visit. If you are interested in contacting Pamela, I'll leave her contact information in the notes. I will also leave a link to her book, Portable Quilting, as well as a link to the New England Quilt Museum website. And if you're wanting to give Quilt As You Go a try, I'm going to leave a link here to the Quilt As You Go playlist. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing people on this show. Let one inspire you. And don't forget, you can now listen to this series as a podcast on the YouTube Music app. Take care, and I'll see you next time.